All right, so I want to welcome you all to today's webinar. Boost your Google search ranking and drive more traffic to your website. Thanks again for joining us today. When people go looking for products or services online, of course we want them to find you, right? We know that stats show that 92% of global search engine market share is actually held by Google. Yet we also know that over 90% of pages actually get no organic search traffic. And that's because they're not properly optimized. And that's why it's imperative that you optimize your web website for search engines, Google in particular, with search engine optimization or what's called SEO, which we're talking about today. And if you think SEO sounds complicated and maybe you're a little unclear about what you're actually supposed to be doing, you're in the right place. Because today we're gonna share some simple things to think about and ways to help you get more found more easily in those search results. With that in mind, let's take a look at our agenda and see more specifically what we're going to cover in today's webinar. We're gonna start by talking about how search engines work. Then we'll talk about how to actually influence those search results and some of the key factors you'll wanna pay attention to. And last but not least, we'll talk about how to focus on the right keywords for your business to get the most impact. Before we get into the details, I'd like to more formally introduce myself as well as my guests for today. My name is Stephanie French and I'm the Senior Content Manager for Webinars here at Constant Contact. I'm also very happy to introduce our guest speaker for the day, David Fisher. He's the founder of Solutions for Growth. Solutions for Growth is a 12-year-old full-service marketing agency and they offer a variety of services. Website development, SEO, which is why we're, he's here today, Google Ads, social media, graphic design, and even some printed materials. They are a Constant Contact certified solution provider, and they manage email marketing and email newsletter letters for a variety of their clients. So David, I'll have you hop on, and if you just wanna say a, a quick hello. Hello, Stephanie, hello everyone. Uh, very happy to be here with you all today. Awesome. And I've had a lot of uh, conversations with you, David, as we're preparing for this, and I know you have lots of great information to share with the audience. So thanks for being here. <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead and dive in. And to start, we'd actually like to have you get get your answer on a poll. So any minute now, you should see a poll show up on your screen, and we want to ask you a question. Have you already done anything to your website to affect your ranking? You might say, no, you haven't done anything. Yes, and you do ongoing work. Yes, uh, and you've only done it one time. Or maybe you're in the category of, I don't know, or I don't remember, which is okay too. So David, right now I see 42% of the audience saying yes, and they do some ongoing work. And 32% are saying, no, they haven't done anything to affect their website ranking so far. Um, that's a little bit expected. Some people do some work on their websites uh, to improve their organic ranking. Uh, others are a little puzzled or intimidated uh, about it. So um, that's in line with what we're seeing. Yeah, I would totally agree. We have a small business in my family here that my husband and I run. And so it was definitely something in the category for me that SEO is not quite something that I'm prepared for. I know lots of things about marketing, but that's not something that I could fully dive into. So I'm glad to know we, you know, we have a variety of people in these audiences. Mm -hmm. Right. So I see a good amount of people who have actually given us an answer, 80%. So thank you for doing that. And I'm gonna share the results on the screen, just so that you all can see how your, your, your peers have voted today. So 28% of you said, no, you haven't done anything for your website to affect your ranking. 35% said, yes, we do ongoing work. 18% of you said, yes, but only once. And 19% of you said, I don't know or remember, which is, is great too. So thank you for participating along those lines with us today. Let's go ahead and dive in. Let's talk about how search engines work because I think this really lays the foundation for everything else we're gonna talk about today. Now, in order to understand how this, these search engines work, it's important to understand what is gonna show up when people go looking. Typically, we say people may search one of two ways. 
they'll either search by your business or organization name or something that your business does or related to what your business or organization does. That might mean they're putting in a keyword into the search, they're using phrases based on what they're looking for, or they're typing out a full question in order to get the answers to questions they have. So here's an example where we're doing a search for a business name, constant contact in this example. David, can you walk us through what exactly we're seeing here and what's gonna show up in this example? Sure, certainly. So the, the main goal of SEO is to be found for a product or service that you sell. If someone knows your company name, they will easily find your company's website. And the example that, that you're presenting here, Stephanie, is showing constant contact. Someone knows the company name constant contact, they're entered in the search field. And what appears is the, at the top, uh, the, a paid ad. This is an indication that constant contact is using Google Ads to appear at the top of the page. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, the first organic listing is also your company website, the constant contact website. And on the right, we see the Google My Business profile, which is a, like a card about uh, your business. We'll get to, into that in just a moment. But uh, once, if, if people know your company name, they will find it quite easily. Definitely. And what if we show uh, scroll down in those same search results? What are some other things that we might see? In this case, we com we keep seeing information about constant contact. There are clearly your uh, social media links. Uh, you even have a Wikipedia page, which is very impressive. On the right, we see online reviews. And this is very clear that uh, all the information presented is about constant contact because the pre people, the person doing the search, knows that the company name is constant contact. Awesome. And those reviews are something that's going to be important that a lot of people are looking for. And that's why I love the Google business profile, because mm -hmm. it shows up right in there. So let's talk about that other scenario. And the other scenario is if they want to search by a phrase, a keyword, or even type out a full question. These results will actually look a little bit different. So what exactly are we looking at here? This is really the crux of SEO. SEO means being found for a product or service that you sell. So for example, if you sell winter sports equipment, you want to be found for skis and snowshoes and poles and boots and gloves and such. Those are the basic keywords you want to be found for. In this example as well, uh, you are looking for a cheese shop near you. And what's appearing at the top of the page is the closest cheese shops near you. And at the top, we see the Concord cheese shop right there. So now it's presenting to you companies that are relevant to the search that you're looking, you, that you're conducting. Great. And then what if, what's, what are we seeing here if we scroll down in this search result? Uh, the first thing you'll see is uh, the Yelp directory about the top, you know, 10 cheese shops in the area. But then the Concord cheese shop is right there, the first organic listing of a business. And that is a wonderful position to be in. And they clearly have been doing a very good job at uh, ranking their website. Great. So those are just some great examples of things that will show up in their articles, websites that are relevant to the search. Um, and then, of course, those reviews, those can all pop up in there. So search engines like Google and Bing, they use that algorithm or what's called an algorithm to determine what displays and at what ranking. So talk to us about some of the important factors of what may, what's going to show up. You're right. So the goal is to appear on page one or two of Google results. Anything after that is of rather limited value. So pages one and two carry a lot of weight. Now, Google's algorithm is really a math formula that takes into consideration about 200 elements. And the and it's like the, the recipe for Coca-Cola. It's a secret, but we kind of know what's what's in there. Uh, the main factors that determine your organic ranking are the website content, what is written on it, backlinks, which are links from other websites to yours, and the structure of the website. Among the other 200 elements, for example, are your domain registration age. So all things being equal, a domain that's been in use for over 10 years carries more weight than a domain that's been in place for the past six months. 
speed, the speed of your website is an important element that uh, helps to rank your website. Faster is better. Internal links, those are links that remain within your website that link from one page to the other. And those are very helpful to Google to help understand how your website is structured. Lately, server location is an important thing. We found uh, a lot of small businesses are using hosting companies that are not in the United States, assuming this is a US-based business, and that creates some delay and that a little bit penalizes your organic ranking. And then content recency. When was the last time your website was updated? So it's important that Google sees that a website is uh, updated on a regular basis. Again, all things being equal, a website that was updated yesterday carries more weight than a website that was updated six months ago. And that's some really great information there in terms of you know making sure or trying to rank in those first two pages and the site speed and the structure, which we'll talk a little bit more about some things specifically for the website here in a few minutes. And I think that gives us a good foundation. Uh, so before we move on, let's just recap a few things. So um, I think it's important to make sure you're found in a variety of these different scenarios. Make sure you're getting found by your, your business name or your organization name, if they know you. And then remember, they might also be searching by keywords or even ask that specific question. And if it's related to your business in one way or another, you wanna make sure you're showing up. David, I know you mentioned there are over 200 elements that can affect the SEO ranking on those search engines. So remember, I, you know, the website is actually one of the most important elements, and that means the content on the website, backlinks, and the overall structure, which we'll talk more about here in, in just a minute. So let's get into that, how to actually influence those results. Let's first uh, talk a little bit more and define SEO. What exactly is SEO and what is the point of it? Sure. So the, the point is to be found for what you sell. You know, considering the millions of websites and every company's direct competition, an effective SEO program is equivalent to providing your business with a huge advantage to be found by a qualified potential customer. And the example of the Concord cheese shop before proves that if you're looking for a piece of cheese, that's where you're going to find it. And being at the top there carries a lot of weight. Great, now I know we've got a few questions that I've seen coming in already about Google Ads, but let's address this whole idea. There's a difference between doing SEO and mm -hmm. Google Ads or what's called search engine marketing or, or also known as SEM. What's the difference between doing these using these two strategies? They're very different, but they work together. So SEO is a long-term approach and gets about 70% of all clicks on Google. Google Ads is immediate though. You pay Google for it and it gets about 30% of clicks. Both are very effective. And the question is, when do I use one and when do I use the other? So typically you would use Google Ads if you're not ranking organically or if you never will, some companies never will because of big competition. So if you want to be appear at the top of page one of Google tomorrow morning, you would launch a Google Ads program and you would appear there right away. So um, SEO is a long-term approach. You won't appear there right away. It's not a quick fix. And typically when an SEO program is started, and we'll get to that in just a moment, the results start appearing in about two to three months long-term or permanent results start appearing after about six months and it's not unheard of to take about a year to rank a company well for what for the keywords they want to be ranked for seo does require ongoing monitoring and different approaches because google changes the rules or the, the algorithm all the time and new competitors implement their own seo program so it's a dynamic always changing system that requires an ongoing maintenance and support and strategy to make sure that your website appears highly ranked. Great. Now, you mentioned that SEO is slow and organic, and it's not just a quick fix, which is a common misconception I, I hear from small businesses all the time. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? How long should it take to start seeing some results when you're doing SEO? 
Right. So as I said earlier, you know, it takes two to three months at the beginning to start seeing results. But what's very important is that um, before we really get into the nitty gritty of an SEO program with clients, we run an audit. And what that means is that we take the client's website and we look at where it's currently ranking compared to where they want to rank for specific keywords. And that will help determine the potential to help this client and what the effort entails, or if there's no potential. So, you know, if, if your website is on page 122 and there's a lot of competition in your industry, we'll be upfront and say, look, it, it's unrealistic to get you from page 122 to page one. So an alternative is to use Google ads because that will put you on page one right away. So the goal is the same for Google ads or SEO but how you get to it based on a lot of moving parts determines which of those two tools to use. So, right. in, so I was just gonna add, Stephanie, that in many cases, we start with Google Ads to get the website right away at the top of page one, and we concurrently start working on SEO as well. Now, we are a Google certified partner, and that is our client's assurance that, you know, that their campaigns are well run and their ad spend is not wasted. But the, or as organic ranking improves, we pull back on Google Ads. It also depends on what keywords are ranking. So if we go back to the winter sports example, you may be ranking well for skis, but not for boots. So we focus on skis in the SEO program, but we use Google Ads for boots because you're not ranking. So in most cases, a combination of both of those tools allow the client to appear on page one for all of their important keywords. That's great because Charlay was asking, is it necessary to pay for Google, for Google ads to increase rankings? And so it sounds like they can definitely work in tandem for different things or different keywords to help in both areas. Is that correct? That's right. You do have to pay Google ads. That's the bulk business of Google. That's how they bring in about $180 billion a year. And that's an indication that it works. And uh, yes, you do have to pay Google each time someone clicks on an ad that brings people to your website. Awesome. Now, David has a really great article on his website. We're gonna share the link in the chat window for those of you who want something to reference later on about which of these may be right for you or um, you know, if when you wanna use those Google ads or the search engine marketing. So thank you for that. So let's talk more about some of these all important elements and let's start with the website. What are the basics of SEO for a website? So the main elements are that, uh, first of all, it needs to be mobile responsive, meaning mobile friendly, so you can view the website easily on a, lap, on a tablet or a phone. Not only is that a good experience for people visiting your website, but it's also one of the important elements in Google's algorithm. In other words, if you don't have a mobile responsive website, you will be penalized. One of the other more technical things that needs to be looked at are tags. Tags, which are numbered H1, H2, and H3, because there's kind of a hierarchy, help Google understand what the website is about and which words on each page carry more weight. And the other thing I recommend to anybody if, if they don't have it yet is to install Google Analytics on the website. Google Analytics is a free tool from Google that creates a dashboard for your business and allows you to see where traffic is coming from, what people's behavior is like, and a host of other information that really gives you insight into the, your website's performance. So if we uh, look at these, uh, I, I put here an example for, to demonstrate these uh, H tags. And uh, American Legends is a client of ours. We've been doing SEO for them for a long time. And uh, this is their homepage. And you'll see that H1 has uh, the, the main, this is the top level tags. And the first one is sell your collection, then add your collection. This is for collections of, of uh, cards, you know, sports cards. And uh, you'll see in the middle of the page, add to your collection. That's a major uh, tag and it's set as H1. Then the next level is H2 and it lists the sports and other elements. So whether it's you know baseball, football, basketball, and so on. And then H3 is one level down and we put there the names of the main um, athletes that uh, appear on Google searches. 
So this explains to Google what the website is about, what the hierarchy is. So if any of these keywords or combination of keywords are put together, it's very easy for Google to understand, hey, American Legends, they are uh, this company that uh, buys and sells uh, these cards. So let me give them a, a, a higher ranking. And these keywords appear in the code behind the website. It's not viewable from a regular visitor, but it's there behind the scenes doing important work. Great. So we've got a couple of links that we're going to share in the chat window there for learning more about Google Analytics and optimizing your website. I know that Carrie was also asking a, a good question here, which is, does everything that we're talking about today, does that all apply to Bing or are there any differences that we would need to make in order to work with Bing better? They're basically the same. The, the, the two companies do tweak their algorithms slightly differently. Uh, many times we don't even know exactly what the difference is because we don't know the exact details of the algorithm. But I would say that 90% of what you're doing for purposes of Google will apply to Bing as well. Awesome. Very good to know. All right. So you've mentioned that content on the website and, of course, backlinks are going to be important for SEO too. So can you talk to us a little bit more about the most important aspects to pay attention to? Sure, certainly. So um, content and backlinks are the preeminent elements that determine SEO. Content is the information that appears on the website, and backlinks are links from other websites to yours. Uh, they're sometimes called inbound links. And uh, Google looks at this very carefully because they, the thinking is, well, if other websites are referring back to you, it means that you are providing something of value and that is useful. So this is we go, where we go into a, a blog. So a blog is a section of the website that contains articles that are relevant to that business. And these articles serve several purposes. Um, and it, it, depending on the strategy, it could be different things. One is these articles present you as an expert. So this is an article, this is a blog page from uh, Pediatric Dental Associates. They are pediatric dentists that we've been working with for years and we uh, create a blog for them. And every month there's an article that helps present them as an expert. So the articles are about uh, dental emergencies for children or everything you should know about pediatric dentistry. And by now we've had hundreds of articles there. And those articles are there to demonstrate the uh, dentist's expertise, but it's also there for SEO purposes because these articles are rich in keywords. They're keyword rich, that's expression. And they're designed to capture um, Google's attention because there's all this content. And you remember recency is an important part. So every time we post a, a blog article, the clock is reset and is sending very strong signals uh, to Google about this. Um, this website right now, we manage over 100 keywords and all of those keywords are ranked on page one of Google, which is a fantastic position to be in for, for the client. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is the uh, term domain authority. So the domain authority is the authority of your website from an SEO perspective, um, this is a definition that was created by Moz uh, some time ago, and it's the measure of the website's ranking power. It's a number that runs between 1 and 100, where 100 is outstanding. And most small businesses rank between 5 and 25. And just to give you a sense, for example, the New York Times is in the 90s. So if you're able to get a link from another website to yours, that link has value but it's also tied to the domain authority of that, uh, of that website. In other words, if you have a link coming to yours from the New York Times, it carries a lot more weight than if it was a link from a, a website that had a lesser domain authority. Then again, um, uh, internal links. So for example, in the blog articles for this dentist, we also put links in the articles to other parts of the website. Again, this informs uh, Google of uh, how the website is structured. Um, and then you, the use of bulleted lists, uh, again, to make it as easy as possible for Google to understand what the website is about, most articles in the middle will have a bulleted list that just makes it easy for it to understand. 
all tags. So all tags uh, is tied to pictures. So whenever there's a picture on a web page, Google can't read it. You can't read a picture. So all pictures have a secondary tag called either alt tag as an alternative tag. Sometimes it's called a description. And you can put in there words that describe that picture. So in the example of the dentist, one of the alt tags might be a young boy with um, teeth problems, things, things like that. So it would be with keywords that are related to the business so that when Google crawls that picture, they'll see the alt tag and they'll see, oh, okay, so this is a child and it's related to teeth. Again, all designed to give Google an indication of what this website is about. Two things uh, not to do. Don't keyword stuff your web page or website. That's putting uh, keywords you want to be found for many, many times on the page. In the olden days, as in many years ago, that was a trick, but Google is very smart and they noticed that and that actually penalizes you. Same thing with transparent copy. Don't put copy that is very keyword rich, that is in the same color as the background of the web page. The human can see it, Google sees it, but they're really smart. And if you play those games, it will penalize you. So a couple of things to, to keep in mind. Very good things to keep in mind there. I don't think enough people think about the alt tags and also knowing the keyword stuffing, and that's something that Google Google actually penalizes for. Right. Now, a question we get every so often when we talk about blogs, is a blog necessary for every business or organization out there? So that's that's a smart question, and the answer is it depends what your strategy is. If SEO is not part of your strategy, you don't need it. But if you want to present your expertise, you might consider having it. The other thing to keep in mind also about a blog is that those blog articles don't only have value for the website, but can, can be repurposed elsewhere. So for example, uh, it can be used in an email newsletter, and I'll comment on that shortly. It can be used as a social post. If you're putting a video as part of the blog, that video can be sliced and diced, and each one of them can be a separate one that can be used, again, on social media. Uh, it can travel in an email. So it, it, the different considerations to, take in, to, to think about when using a blog, if, it, if you don't need to present your expertise, if you're not interested in SEO, if you are not doing email marketing or using social media, you don't need it. If any of these other elements are important to your business, yes. So the short version of the story is it can hurt if you can do it, do it. That's awesome because people ask me all the time or tell me, I don't know what to put on social media and I don't want to know what to put in my email. If you're already doing the work for this SEO on your blog, it is great for repurposing and sharing that information. Because right. the fact of the matter is people aren't sitting out there on your website or waiting for your next blog article to come out. It's great for showing your expertise. So you mentioned a, a few things uh, like no keyword stuffing or using transparent copy, but what actually makes good content for a website or a blog besides that? You have to think about the perspective of people coming to your website and what would they want to know about you and what questions do they have. So one way to look at whether it's a blog article or other information on the website is uh, every business owner has people asking the same 10 questions all the time. Put the answers to those questions directly or indirectly on the website. The other thing I would suggest when you're considering writing information about the website and your business is to write it from the perspective of the reader. Don't write content on your website that starts with the word we or I or and so on. Uh, it's not about you, it's about the reader. So something that we frequently do when uh, working on a website or redoing a website for a client is to change the content so it really reflects the needs of the reader, explains what features they are, but particularly the benefits. So there is a, call it an art and a science to writing content, again, whether it's a website or a social media post or an email newsletter or so on, that really addresses the needs of the reader not just promoting yourself very aggressively because that's a turnoff. 
Agreed. So we've got a lot of great questions coming in here, especially about this content piece. So let's try to go through a few of them now. Sure. Ken is asking, is there an optimal length or number of words for your blog post? I would say a minimum of four or 500 words and a maximum of 3,000. For purely good. SEO purposes, longer is better. Good point. Uh, so Jennifer asks, in regards to keyword stuffing, how many keywords is too many? <laughs> um, I would say if, it, if you're writing a blog article or web page, more than three or four is too much. Unless there's a specific reason to have them there, um, but keep keep the the language in the article or the the web page natural. Uh, so if there's a need to use the keywords, use them. If you're forcing it just for SEO purposes, it will come off um, not ideal for the reader, and it may start falling in the keyword stuffing uh, world. Again, there is no information that from Google that says, well, after six keywords, we're going to penalize it. They don't share that information. It, their point is that the content on the web page needs to be um, natural, normal, of value, and not forced. Great. I couldn't agree more with that. Ricky asks, how often should you add content to your blog? Uh, every 10 minutes. I know, I'm <laughs> kidding. I'm exaggerating. But it's tied to the recency aspect. So. Uh, the reality is we, we don't have time to update our blogs all the time, but a, a cadence of maybe once a month, every two weeks is a, re is a reasonable cadence. If you want to be very assertive in your SEO program, you might do it every week or every three days. Again, it's a question of time and effort and sometimes money, um, but uh, more is better, purely from an SEO perspective on your blog. All right, totally agree with that one too. Now, Roseanne asks, I heard video is best. No one wants to read. What are your thoughts there? Yes and no. So video, video carries plenty of weight in the SEO world, particularly if the video is hosted at YouTube because YouTube belongs to Google. So Google favors that. And in certain situations, having a video on your website is very helpful because the information that comes across in the video might be lengthy if it was written. The flip side of the argument is that the video does carry some weight from an SEO perspective, but it cannot be read or indexed by Google. So having the copy, meaning the content, what's written on the website is also important. The other thing to keep in mind also is the context of when that video is used. There may be situations where people can't watch the video, can't have audio. So whether it's someone at work and they don't want to play a video or someone is at home and they have a sleeping baby. So put yourself in the shoes of who's coming to your website and decide whether it should be all video or, or um, written or some combination of both. Ah, very good. All right, so we've we've covered content here. Let's talk about the Google Business Profile. Someone earlier said something about, I heard Google Business Profile or Google My Business was going away. Uh, David, I'll let you answer in a minute, but I think what the misconception here is Google, Google My Business or Google Business Profile is not going away. What I do know that Google My Business changed its name to formally, or yeah, formally Google Business Profile. Sorry if I can get that out there. So let's talk a little bit more about Google Business Profile. Tell us how this works for our ranking and some things to pay attention to here. So Google Business Profile, also known or unknown as Google My Business and so on, yeah. but it's basically an account that is give, uh, available to every business uh, set up by Google. It's at no cost. And it's a way for Google to classify every business in the United States. So it makes it very easy for people to learn about it. So if you look at any Google uh, profile, uh, it will have basic information like name and address and uh, phone number. Um, there are, it's easy, it's connected to Google Maps for review, for directions, there are reviews. And um, if you haven't yet, I strongly suggest you claim, you have to claim that listing, make sure it's possible populated with as much information as possible. And over the past couple of years, Google has added many more fields to these accounts. So you can add all sorts of information to it and maintain it. It's not something that you do once and that's it, but you maintain it. 
few comments about how this relates to SEO. An active, well-completed um, profile carries weight for your ranking. In addition, Google reviews are very heavily used for SEO purposes. The number of reviews and also whether you have you know, three, four, five stars on average. So um, one of the things that we, we develop for our clients is tools to ensure that they're able to gather online reviews pretty easily and frequently. And that's an important part of the SEO program. Um, it, it's a major ranking signal. And if you're not using it and, and touching it on a regular basis, it, it's a missed opportunity. I couldn't agree more. It's so helpful as a consumer. You're getting those reviews and all that pertinent information that people want to know right then and there when they're searching for it. And also really beneficial for you as a business or organization because you're able to get your information out there and be seen. Now, if you're curious about Google Business, we're going to be sharing some more information, two links in the chat window. There's going to be an article on Google My Business or Google Business Profile if you want to learn how to set that up and more information about it. And David also has a really good article out there on his website on the importance of local marketing. So look in the chat window for that as we'll be sharing it. Now, I see, uh, actually, this answers Robert's question right here, and he wants to know what is a typical range of cost for an SEO provider. So I'll let you take it away, David. Sure, sure. So there are uh, two approaches that we take when we manage SEO for our clients. So some of them are looking for a one-time SEO setup, which entails, um, as it says, a one-time approach to working on the website to look at their structure, to add alt tags, to complete the Google My Business profile, um, and a whole bunch of other things to get the website set up and to be easily crawled by a Google. The fee is anywhere between $500 and $1,500, depending on the extent of the website and the extent of the work that needs to be done. The vast majority of SEO work that we do, though, is ongoing. As I said, it's typically, it, it does take time. And it can range from a few hundred dollars a month to $2,000 a month. And when we present this to the client, we provide or we offer three uh, service levels. So option A, B, or C. And it's tied to different dollar amounts that are tied to how much work is done on the website each month. So it can, it can accommodate uh, what they're, they're comfortable uh, spending. And the work entails creating content, developing backlinks, modifying the structure. Uh, speeding up the page, the speed of the pages, um, and all the work that you know we mentioned until now that needs to happen so that you can start ranking. Uh, the fee also depends on where you rank today. You know, if you're on page six, it's going to take less effort to get on page one than if you're on page 88. Um, I would like to comment on a couple of things that uh, the industry is dealing with, and that is that uh, many agencies or many organizations frequently offer guarantees for placement of websites. In other words, oh, we'll guarantee we'll get you in the first three, stop, three top three spots of, of, of the Google listing. And if you hear a guarantee, uh, consider running away as fast as possible because it's impossible to guarantee the placement of a website when everything is dependent on Google and their algorithm. Uh, there are too many forces, too much competition uh, that uh, does not allow anybody to guarantee something like that. The other thing to keep in mind is that uh, some agencies will uh, offer SEO services for unrealistically low amounts of $100, $200 a month. Um, those are not true SEO programs, but really small one-time updates to the website, maybe some you know, monthly updates to your Google, Google My Business account. Uh, it's, it's very limited and it will not have a material impact on your SEO. So uh, the bottom line is SEO is a long-term program. Uh, it, is, it does require an investment because it takes a lot of time and effort and skill to do. Uh, but the benefit, once that's in place, is a, a ranking like the Conco Cheese Shop that has a material impact on the amount of traffic that you get to your website. 
Very good. All really great information, especially that part of, you know, the the guarantee of getting you in a certain spot, because in a lot of a lot of cases, you can't really guarantee that because you've got those um, the algorithm that they don't tell you exactly what they're ranking things on. So we're in a good place with this section. Let's go ahead and just recap a few things so that we can move on and talk more specifically about keywords, which I've seen a few questions about. So for here, of course, make sure you're optimizing your website. That's ultimately the biggest place you're gonna improve your search ranking. Ensure that your website is mobile responsive. It needs to have some great content. And like David said, a blog can be super helpful here. And plus that content can be repurposed in other areas of your marketing, is, which is one of my favorite parts about it. You wanna have those backlinks that are important from other websites that go to yours. And last but not least, set up a Google business profile as that's another important ranking signal. Mm -hmm. right. Perfect, so let's dive in and let's talk about how you can focus on the right, right keywords and get the most impact. So how do we really know which keywords to focus on? And I've seen some people post questions about like finding out the best keywords for the art industry and things like that. Uh, that's done in a conversation and then research. So we'll approach, uh, you know, we'll talk with a client and we'll ask them, well, give me, you know, the top 10, 15 keywords you want to be found for. And then the client will tell us. And then using our own experience and tools, we come back to the client with a list of keywords, again, depending on the industry, that is typically very long. It could be 50, it could be 300. And then we review the list of keywords together to identify the ones that make sense. And we usually keep a rather substantial list of those keywords. Um, in the example that you see on the screen here, this is for a, uh, a cleaner, a, dry, a small chain of dry cleaners. Uh, they're called Minutemen. And uh, this is just the top of a very long spreadsheet that shows for each of those keywords uh, what the monthly search volume is and what their current position is. So as, this, in, as an example, in the city of Westport, there's a misspelling there purposely, minute man instead of minute men. And that mis misspelling has a search volume of about 200 each month. And they're currently on position number three, which is a great place to be. But each of those keywords has a different position. And uh, if you were to see the rest of the spreadsheet, the bulk of the other keywords are in much lower positions, seven, eight, nine, 15, 33, and so on. So we'll be working with them to develop an SEO program that elevates all of these keywords closer to the top of page one uh, so that uh, they get found more easily for people looking for dry cleaners. Um, we also use tools such as Keyword Planner, Moz, and RFs, and so on. These are tools that allow us to see what keywords their competitors are using, what kind of volume they're of, uh, what these would cost if they were on Google Ads, all good indication of what's important to the market, what is working and what's not. So you can do some basic research on your own, but typically you need these, these tools to better understand what keywords are really driving the traffic to particular websites. That's great. So using some keyword planner like the Moz or Ahrefs, um, and then that allows you to see the terms that the competitors are using as well so that you can right. better compete in search. I love that. All right, so we're at a good place. We have tons and tons of really great questions coming in. So I wanna make sure we have enough time for all of those. Let's go ahead and recap a bit. And David, I'd like to get your final thoughts and anything you'd like to leave the audience with today. Sure, so your ranking online typically comes down to what really Google thinks of your website. It's really beneficial to really spend some time optimizing your website to better compete in search results. SEO can be a huge opportunity. Think of that Concord cheese shop. And although it's a long-term program that requires time and effort and sometimes money, the benefits can be substantial as once your website is well positioned, the effort to maintain the ranking becomes easier. There's also an interesting paradigm where the more organic traffic you get, the more this helps with your ranking. So your high ranking helps you keep that position. I'd also mention that SEO should be part of an overall marketing program. For example, 
we believe very strongly in integrating your marketing tools. So if you start getting traffic to your website through SEO or Google Ads, it's important that your website is effective at collecting contact information from your visitors, whether it's through a pop-up or landing page that offers something of value, such as a coupon or information. When the visitors enter their email address, this is then automatically added to your constant contact account. And that triggers an autoresponder or also known as an email nurture series that nurtures the prospect. This is something we put in place for clients very regularly and is a smart way to attract new visitors and turn them into customers. I couldn't agree any, any more on that, that last bullet there because you're doing all this work to drive traffic to your website, even if it's Google Ads combined with SEO and all of that, if you're driving them there, we're probably first gonna hope they're buying or booking a service with us and whatnot, but we've gotta have a way to capture that information because not everybody is going to buy when they visit our website. Mm -hmm. But if we have the ability to capture their information, we can then influence them later on with email marketing, which is why all of these tools, David, that you've talked about should really be working together for your benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for anyone who wants to get started today on their own, what would be some simple things that they could do in order to get started? Start focusing on content on your website that includes the keywords you want to be found for and the information surrounding those keywords. Start developing backlinks by contacting other businesses that would consider including content with a link to your website. Make sure Google, you, have a, you claim and update your Google My Business profile. It also has the option to post regularly, almost like social media. Make sure you do that. Those are all signals that Google looks at related to your business. And too often, I find that small business profiles on Google have information that's obsolete, whether it's their hours or their phone number. Make sure that's correct, not only for Google, but also for consumers looking for your business. I love that part because in the last couple of years, things have been on, they've been off, we've been closed, we've been open, we've had to adjust our hours for staffing needs and all of that. So now more than ever is important if you've got that business profile, go back and make sure that information has your mo most up to date and that's going to be beneficial for SEO purposes as well. I love it, David, thank you. So I just wanna let you all know, Constant Contact has many great tools to help your small business. As an add-on to Constant Contact packages, I do want to let you all know that we have an SEO tool. That tool scans your websites, your website, and then can provide personalized recommendations for what you can do for your SEO purposes. So if you want to learn more about that and how it works, we'll be sharing a link in the chat window. And David uh, has spent some really great time with us, and I hope you all have learned just as much from him as I have. And I know you have a special offer for our audience today. Do you wanna tell them about that? Yes, so we created a document called Seven Things You Need to Know About Marketing. And I know the word things is a little unusual, uh, but it's really different aspects of marketing that any small business owner needs to know. It covers things like strategy, branding, what marketing tools are most effective, it's not a long document, but it really helps to get you thinking. And it's it's a kind of a strategy that we use when we work with our clients. Um, I believe there is a link in the chat for this. So if you click the link in the chat, uh, you can easily uh, receive that document. Um, it really um, is designed to get you thinking about what you need to do. And the thinking addresses something that we see very often with, uh, with the folks that we work with, which is, so often people are working on their business, I'm sorry, in their business, not on their business. And it's really important to be able to step back for a moment and think about, okay, so what do I need to do to really bring my business to the next level, implement new marketing tools, improve them, really the steps that I need to really get my phone to ring more. I love it. David has so much expertise in different services. So we're also going to share a link not only to how to get that document, but also to David's website. So I think I've seen somewhere in the chat window that a few of you might be looking to work with David or learn more about what the services that he offers. We're also going to share that in there. And rest assured, if you don't catch the links in the chat window, we'll be sharing them out later on with the email that includes the link to the recording. 
So a few things really quickly before we get to these questions. When we end the webinar today, a survey is going to pop up on your screen. We'd really love it if you'd just take a minute or two to answer two simple questions and tell us what you thought about the webinar today. And I just want to let you all know and remind you, we've got almost a thousand people, I think, who've joined us over the webinar and have sent in many, many questions. So there's a good chance we're not going to be able to get through all of them. But keep in mind, David and I are going to do a little bit of work tomorrow and answer more of these questions. What I'll do is in the follow-up email is I'll include a link to where we'll be posting that video. All right, David, lots of great questions here. Sure. Um, so Heather is wanting to know, it, she, she says, hoping you can have a chance to touch on outreach of community for nonprofits. So we talked about a lot, and I think a lot of what you said could apply to nonprofits, but are there any differences or things to keep in mind there? Sure. It's tied to the goal of the nonprofit. If you're looking for donations, the call to action is going to be to make a donation. If you're looking for volunteers, it'll address that. So if we relate this to SEL, it's what is your goal on the website? Do you want to get more volunteers? Then create a page that only talks about volunteers and how it works and the benefit and the joys and, and rewards of being a volunteer for your organization. If you're looking to raise donations, you'll have a separate page that talks just about donations. And the call to action there will be to one degree or another, you know, please make a contribution, whether it's money or, or material things or things like that. So if any any marketing tool and messaging is derived from your goal. Determine what your goal is, and that will inform you in terms of what tool you're going to need and what messaging you need. Very good. So Buddy asks, we just launched a new remodeled website. Our designer said that they addressed SEO optimization. What questions should I ask them? <laughs> So what the designer probably did as part of the SEO optimization is add a few items here and there to the website so if Google maybe understands uh, what, what the website is about. So the questions to ask are, um, show me the tags, the H1, H2, and H3 tags. Show me the meta tags. Um, uh, show me a test from Google showing that the website is mobile friendly. Uh, and what else did you specifically do? We see frequently, we, we get, we um, clients show us proposals from other agencies for the website that is being built. And invariably, there's a couple of sentences that say, oh, we'll include SEO, blah, blah, blah. But it's very vague. As you heard from this presentation, SEO is not something that you do in 15 minutes when you build a website. Uh, so ask specific questions like the ones that I just mentioned now to really document what this developer did for SEO purposes. That's great because that goes back to all that you were talking about when it comes to pricing and being care mm -hmm. careful of those guarantees and things like that. They might be uh, doing a little bit of work, but maybe they're not doing all that they could really do to be optimizing right. your website for you. So I love that. I missed who the question came from, but uh, I think a few people are asking, how do they know what their current website ranking is in search? So there are a couple of ways to, to find out. One is don't just Google um, your business using Chrome or Firefox or anything like that, because you'll be logged in as yourself and the results are gonna be skewed based on what Google thinks you want to see. So if you type in the name of your business, chances are it's gonna be first. If you type in the services or products that you sell, chances are they're gonna be pretty high. So the way to measure the real ranking of your website is to use some of the tools I mentioned earlier, like Ahrefs, that's spelled A-H-R-E-F, or Moz, uh, there's a whole bunch of other ones, and you can just Google, <laughs> um, how does my website rank, or what's my website ranking, and you'll find out. Uh, and they will all have very slight differences one from the other because a website ranking depends on many variables, where you are, what exact keywords you're looking for, and so on. So um, it does a little bit of, takes a little bit of digging, and your website may rank very well for a specific keyword, but not for another keyword. So again, it's, I know it's a long answer, but that's the reality of how SEO works. No, that's great because it's important to know those types of things, and especially knowing 
because I got to, you know, as a business owner, you're probably going to your website to look at it a little bit more and you don't want those results to be skewed. You want to see what other people who haven't been there before are, are actually seeing. And exactly. And an example is location. If the owner of the Concord cheese shop, if she is in the office of the Concord cheese shop, typing in cheese shop near me, clearly they're going to come up first. Yes. Good point. So Daniel asks, is it easy to change the Google business profile if, if it is wrong? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you, once you claim it and Google makes you jump through a couple of hoops to prove that you're the business owner, you can modify anything in there. Sure. Awesome. Um, so that one we just answered. So Caroline asks, are there digital marketing, Google Analytics, or Google ad certifications you might recommend? Caroline says she is Google Analytics certified, but has not seen a GA4 certification. So GA4 is the new Google Analytics tool. Uh, I haven't seen anything about that yet. Um, it's going to start rolling out. It, it's starting now, but it's going to be in full force in 2023. They probably don't even have a certif certification for that yet. Gotcha. Good point. Uh, Holly asks, how do you recommend figuring out what keywords to audit for a website? So you talked a little bit about Moz and Arefs. Um, I guess, and what would be the best way to use that tool? Because I think when you go in and you're using the keyword planner, you're going to have to put in some keywords to start with. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Start with the use your own judgment in terms of what you want to be found for. In the example of the dry cleaners before, you know, dry cleaning near me, um, uh, suit pressing, uh, laund uh, shirt laundering, um, you know, laundry by the pound. Think about those and that's going to be a starting point. And those 15 keywords are going to probably account for at least half of the keywords that people are using. Um, the, the, Start with that and see how you rank with those and focus on those. It, it's sometimes better, it's almost always better to focus on a smaller number of keywords and get ranked for those than trying to be to rank for more unusual keywords, still related to your business, but you know, maybe there isn't enough traffic that warrants working for that, that keyword. Um, it, it's a subjective decision, but start with a dozen keywords that you know are the core of your business. Love it. So Rita asks, does it matter what area of your business website gets updated constantly for SEO, like the homepage? <laughs> Good question. Um, I don't have enough an exact answer. Uh, I know there's a date of last update for the website, and I don't believe it's on a page basis, but rather it's on the website basis but I'm not certain about that. Um, so perhaps when we get back, Stephanie, with the questions, that's something we can look into as well. Because I'm not certain. Perfect. I will note that for when we address the rest of the questions. Yeah. This is a great question from Barbara. Most of our website traffic is desktop. Is it still important to be optimized for mobile? Yes, because even if it's 10% of the people who are looking at your website on a mobile device want to be able to see it and understand well what the website is about. That's the human user experience. If we're talking about SEO, if your, mobile, if your website is not mobile friendly or responsive, you're actually being penalized by Google because of that. Very good. One last so little think, comment. Oh. Uh, until a few years ago, um, agencies were offering mobile websites as a secondary website to your main one. Don't do that because now you're dealing with two websites and the technology by now is obsolete. Any website that appears on desktop or laptop and so on uh, needs to be um, mobile friendly as it is automatically. Don't go down the rabbit hole of a second website just for mobile use. It sounds like that could end up competing SEO wise Correct. together. It, it, it's a mess and it's in the okay. it work. Very good to know. Yeah. So let's try to address one more question here from Cynthia. So, is it good to put a link to a blog post on my website from a newsletter, something that they send to their list? Does this help to increase SEO in Google? 
So you sent a newsletter, an email newsletter, and there's a link to that newsletter um, on your website. That's um, how I understand the question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, purely from an SEO perspective, it helps a little bit because Google looks also at outbound links and you should have a small number of outbound links and so on. If there is value in that email newsletter to the reader, then yes. Um, I would caution you with using outbound links on your website because think of your website as a store. The moment someone comes into your store or your website, you want to keep them there as long as possible. So if you're creating an outbound link, there needs to be a real reason why you're sending this person away from your website and then you lost them. Uh, and if you do create that link, make sure that link opens up a new tab. It doesn't replace your existing tab, otherwise your website disappears. Awesome. I love it. So that, I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I know we didn't get to all of the questions. And like I said, we'll post a link to where we'll be posting a video that Dave and I are going to put together tomorrow to answer more of these questions. So David, I want to thank you so much for being here. You've pr provided so much information and expertise to our audience today. And to all of you in the audience, thank you for participating and sending in your questions and engaging with us today. So I'm going to go ahead and close out of today's session, um, but I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Great. Thank you to everyone. Bye. And thank you. Bye. Thanks, David. Bye.